I want to throw a shout out first to Amir. <clears throat> Do not let this guy back you into a corner. <laughs> he does not take no. In fact, he's a poster child for how we should all be as salespeople because I think I said no uh, several thousand times. And uh, finally I caved in. So, and then we, I figured, okay, I'll move this forward till June. Maybe they'll forget about me. Not a chance. <laughs> Somebody canceled out that was supposed to be here today, and uh, here I am because I couldn't say no to Michael. So just know that uh, if you're struggling as a salesperson, you've got a couple really good salespeople here to learn from their techniques. Before I get started with what I had prepared, I want to let you know that today is Vietnam Veterans, uh, War Veterans uh, Day. President Trump signed this into law that we finally get some recognition for those of us who the country back during the Vietnam War. <laughs> Are there any other veterans in the audience? So please stand up, be recognized. Rob? <laughs> you, you said yes, but others wouldn't. So thank you. Alrighty, so I was asked to talk about helping you know, younger folks in the business uh, learn a little bit more about what to go on, and I thought, you know, some of us old timers need reminders too. So what I'm about to present to you is nine ideas that I had to learn early on and throughout my career so that I was able to still be here 35 years later. You may say, oh, I know that already, but you might also pick up something you didn't know. So let's go forward. And the first thing I had to learn, the most important thing was, I had to ask for business. And I had to figure out where to find it before I could ask for it. You know, so that was a real struggle. My first day after training class with Merrill Lynch Realty was an open house I held. And I actually sold that property at that open house. So I'm thinking to myself, what's the big deal? <laughs> this is easy. A couple came in, I showed the house. It wasn't my listing, of course. It was the guy that sat in front of me in the office. <clears throat> and uh, I wrote up a contract. And in those days, we actually went to the seller's house mm -hmm. and presented the offer. And uh, it got accepted. So Monday, I opened escrow. And on Thursday, I got a call from the title company. Your buyer's check bounced. <clears throat> but don't worry, they were probably just transferring money from one account to the other. So I went and took, picked up the check from the title company, went over to the buyer's house. They were renters. Sure enough, that was the issue. They were transferring funds from one account to the other. They wrote me another check. I took it to the title company on Friday. And on Tuesday or Wednesday of the following week, I got another phone call from the title company. The check bounced again. So I went and picked it up, and I went to the buyer's house, and they were gone. There was nobody there. I could look in through windows, and all the furniture was gone. They just blew out of town. That was my first transaction. <laughs> The worst part about it was that I had to go in the office every day. We actually did that in those days, back in 1986. And um, Richard would turn around and look forward at me and go, well, Jerry, how are our buyers doing? This went on for about three months until he got tired of it. So I had to figure out how to find business. So in those days, <clears throat> open houses were big. We had buyers coming through on open houses. And um, if you didn't have an open house, you had to struggle. So I did open houses quite a bit. We did cold calls. We had pizza party nights. When we would get the reverse phone directory, which told us the phone numbers of people on the street. That was back before cell phones. So we would sit around and make phone calls. That was also before uh, do not call us. Okay. We did door knocking. Anybody do door knocking? Some of you still do. 
you know, door knocking actually works. And uh, and I hooked up with another one, a woman in the office because the two of us could go out and we could be you know more powerful together. We looked better and it was safer for both of us to do that. And we did pretty well with that. And then we did mailers and we did letters. Postcards weren't ha weren't a thing yet, so we did letters and business envelopes. So that was what we were doing. Um, from the larger picture, but I figured out that I wanted to work expired listings. And the reason why I wanted to work expired listings is because there was very little competition. Most realtors didn't want to call a seller whose listing didn't sell because they knew the seller was going to be angry. They didn't know how to deal with it. And by the same token, talking to the bid books. So I trained my car to stop when we found a for sale by owner sign. It was pretty hard to do that because the brakes failed in front of every FISBO sign for a while until I got that fixed. But I figured out how to work with FISBOs. So that was my launch. But the issue for me, and maybe for some of you, was fear. I had a lot of fear about being rejected. I had a lot of fear that um, I wasn't going to be able to feed my family. I had a lot of fear that I was going to fail in the business. Anybody had that? <laughs> Every hand should go up. <laughs> we all have fear. And um, the problem was, is I knew how to deal with fear, but I wasn't dealing with it properly. So I was told that fear has two meanings. I changed the first word to forget because we know what it really is. <laughs> Forget everything and run, or face everything and rise. The choice is yours. It is a personal choice. Everything is a personal choice. But you forget. So, Michael mentioned I'm a Marine. I joined 19, uh, 70, no, 1968. I'm trying to give myself 10 years more life, but I joined in 1968. And that went to Paris Island, and that was in the height of the Vietnam War. So you may think that wasn't a very brilliant move. Actually, it was. So here I am at Marine Corps boot camp, and I'm being taught how to do hand-to-hand -hand combat using a rifle and bayonet service. And you know, I've got my war face on, thinking I'm Buster Badass. <laughs> After boot camp, I'm home on leave, and I'm practicing my thousand-yard stare. I haven't seen any combat, but it was right before I went to Vietnam. Here I am on Thanksgiving Day at the Rock Pile, which is one of the forward fire bases up along the DMZ. My very first day, the captain asked me to drive him out there, just the two of us in an open Jeep, 20 miles down the road. I am scared out of my skull. The picture doesn't show it that I am totally, completely shaking in my boots. This is a picture of one of the guns that I supported. And these are the rounds, the, the, the things that those guns fired. Each one of them weighed 200 pounds. It was full of high explosive. My job was to drive a truck with that many rounds on there. It's about 10 tons. And, uh, excuse me, about 10,000 pounds worth of rounds from Quang Tri to the rock pile about three days of a week. The rest of the time I was on the line pretending I was an infantry soldier. The day before Armstrong landed on the moon, a bunch of us took a 100 mile trip down to Da Nang through Indian country, and here we are at the Haidon Pass just north of Da Nang. I show you these things not because I want you to think, oh, you're pretty cool. I want you to think that, you know, there is fear when we all face it. And the Marines taught me to face my fears. You had to do it. You faced your fears and you did it. And when I finally remembered that, then I was able to move forward in our business. Oprah says, we all know who Oprah is, and we believe every word she says, you get in life what you have the courage to ask for. So very, very true. So if you're struggling with your fears, face it, just deal with it. 
Those of you who are brand new in our business, this is a fabulous business for 35 years. I have done all sorts of things in this business, and I've never had the same day twice. It's just fabulous. You know, but face the fears and go for it. That was the first thing I had to learn. The next thing is I had to look for success clues. Success is all around you. Look around this room. We got people here that have been in business 50 plus years that have been wildly successful and they're still doing it. What could you learn from them? How about other folks that have relatively new yet have had great success? What could you learn from them? Look for the clues. So Tony Robbins says, happy, vibrant, successful people think and behave in certain ways. So do miserable and unfulfilled people. <laughs> In other words, there are patterns of success and patterns of failure. The good news is success leaves clues. My mentor, Jim Rohn, was the guy who first said that. He mentored Tony Robbins. Success leaves clues. You have to find them. So here's my suggestion to you. Identify a successful person in your field, whatever business you happen to be in, and invite them to coffee or lunch and interview them. How did you get started? What challenges did you face? How did you overcome them? What challenges do you face today? What are you doing about it? What advice do you have for me as a newer person? That also works for those of us who are experienced. Everybody has had a different set of issues and challenges to overcome, and they all have a different perspective. And so somebody can sit and talk with you and look at your business and see what you're doing and see a different way that you might not be able to see. So hook up with them. Go out and take them to lunch, take them to coffee, sit and chat. Next, I had to be curious. I do not know at all. Barbara Corcoran, do we know who she is? Yeah. Queen of New York real estate, star of Shark Tank. You don't need to know someone personally to get their knowledge today. This is the good news. If you don't want to take somebody to lunch, follow them on social media, listen to podcasts, read books, soak up all the free information to get, that you can get to get ahead. It's out there. Most of the breakthrough discoveries and remarkable inventions throughout history, from flints for starting a fire to self-driving cars, have something in common. Can you guess what it is? Imagination. Result of curiosity. Somebody's trying to figure something out. Einstein said, I have no special talent. I'm only passionately curious. It's like one of the greatest minds of the century. And he said, I'm nothing special. I'm just curious. If you got to be curious about our business, what could you learn? What could you learn? Where could you go? Exercise your curiosity. Speaking of goals, I know I haven't spoken of goals yet, but I thought I'd slip this in here. How many people have written goals? How many of you have looked at them in the last three months? How many of you looked at them today? Okay, great, I'm happy for you. The rest of you, what's up? <laughs> what are you doing? <clears throat> Just briefly about goal setting. You gotta have goals. You gotta know where you're going. Otherwise, when you get up in the morning, you're gonna end up somewhere, but it'll be somebody else's goal that gets you there, not yours. If I don't know where I'm going when I get up in the morning, I know I'm gonna end up somewhere. Question about that, but just where is the question? So I have to have some goals. So they're called SMART goals, which means they're specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. Let's look at each one of those uh, characteristics. A specific goal should be clear so that you know where you're going to have to focus your efforts. There's five W questions to answer to help you set that goal. What do I want to accomplish? Duh. What do I want? Why is it important? You know, if without a why, it's really hard to work on your goals. So you've got to have a big, fat why. 
Who's involved? Is it just you? Do you need other help? Other people? Where is it located? And what resources or limits to my ability are involved? What do I need to work on? Measurable. It's important to have measurable goals. I, I can't. I can set a goal. So I want to be the top producer, but it's hard to measure that. I might want to say, I would like to sell 10 homes this year. That's a little more measurable. But how about with making a goal that says, I want to do this type of prospecting and this much by every day. That might be a better measurable goal. So to address questions such as how much, how many, and how will I know when I've done it? Good question. Achievable. It needs to be realistic and attainable. It'd be a stretch, you need to stretch out a little bit, but you don't set it so far that you can't get there. And when you have an achievable goal, then you get to pat yourself on the back, because you gotta celebrate this, you gotta celebrate the win. An achievable goal will usually answer questions such as, how can I accomplish it? How realistic is it? Based on other constraints such as financial uh, situation. For instance, I wanna send out 10,000 postcards a month. Really? That means you have $15,000 a month to spend? Maybe not. Okay. Relevant. Making sure that the goal actually matters and that it aligns with your other relevant goals. So a relevant goal can answer yes to these questions. Does it seem worthwhile? Is it something I really should be going for? Is this the right time? Right now you might say, gee, I, I want to go after expired listings. Is this the right time for expired listings? <laughs> they're out there, but they're few and far in between. So, does this match our other efforts? Am I the right person to reach that goal? Yeah. What questions to ask yourself? And is it applicable in today's environment? Again, the example of an expired listing, the answer to that would have to be no. Now, I really shouldn't focus my business on expired listings at the moment. I should be ready for it though. The market turns. All those listings may not sell. They may expire. I'd be ready for it. And then it needs to be time bound. You have to set a date that you're going to complete your goal. But for no other reason, just so you can celebrate. It usually answers these questions. When, what can I do six months from now? What can I do six weeks from now? What can I do today? This is why you want to look at your goals every day. Look at them either first thing in the morning or the last thing at night. Sometimes looking at them last thing at night is a good way to go because it puts your subconscious mind to work on them while you're asleep. If you're the kind of person where that'll keep you up at night, then don't do that. Do it in the morning, okay? So here's a simple goal that worked for me. And it answers all of the five things, and it's very simple, and you can do it. Every night, lay out five business cards next to your card keys. And make it your goal to meet five new people every day and give them your card. As you're giving them the card, you're talking to them and finding out what kind of issues they might be having. Do they have any needs? It may not be that they need to sell a house, may not mean that they want to buy a house, but if they own a house, or if they're renters, they may have issues that you know somebody here who can help them solve. So if I find out that you're having an issue or a problem that I can help you solve, and I hope you do it, what does that do for me? Right. I'm there solving a problem for them. Even though it needs no money for me at the moment, it might down the road. So find five people and give them your card. Do your best to get that done before you come home. They told us when I first learned of this, don't come home until you've done it. So a lot of people were reported as missing. You know? <laughs> they just weren't home. But no, the reality of it is, is do your best. I had to seek out some inspiration because some of this stuff is hard and I needed to find people that could help me um, get there. So let others lead small lives, but not you. Let others argue over small things, but not you. 
Let others cry over small hurts, but not you. Let others leave your future in someone else's hands, but not you. Get some inspiration. So get a mentor. So I enjoy the, the KW gang because you guys have institutionalized the mentor program really well. But for those of us who are not there, there's some other things to think about. So a mentor should help you with giving you some direction. How to do this. Get some training. Training is ongoing, it's forever. You will never learn enough in this business, no matter how long you've been in the business, there will always be something new for you to learn. You'll get support from a mentor through the rough patches, through figuring out how to do things. A good mentor will kick you in the butt when you need a kick in the butt. We all do. A mentor will help you get to your goal, which leads to your success. So what are the qualities of a mentor that you should look for? Well, first of all, let me back up. Some of the folks that inspired me were Tommy Hopkins. Anybody hear Tommy Hopkins? Thanks. Great salesman. Great salesman. Good books. Good books. I, I refer to him as the king of refrigerator sales 101. <laughs> How to sell anything. Mike Perry. We've all heard of his kid, but Mike was the king of no excuses, take no prisoners. Go out and get it done. Brian Buffini. I know we've heard of Brian, he's still around doing good things. Mike is still around too. Jim Rohn passed away a few years ago. I had the great pleasure of actually meeting him face to face in San Jose uh, at one of his weekend retreats. And I would strongly suggest that you Google Jim Rohn and, or do it on YouTube and watch some of his videos. Very plain spoken, homespun guy, humorous, but he hits you right between the eyes. And then Brian Tracy, he wrote a program called The Psychology of Sales. I had it on cassette tape. I listened to it in my car, days on end. Well worth it. Earl Nightingale. Earl Nightingale. There, now that guy is at least 2,000 years old at this point. <laughs> but great, great stuff from him. He founded a company called Nightingale Conan, and he took all the wisdom of all the great mentors of the years past and put it on cassette tape. And you could drive around in your car and listen to it. Today you would do it on podcast, but you can still do it. So the qualities of a great mentor, it's kind of hard to see, so I'll kind of go through this with you. There's 10 of them. A great mentor always pushes you to be better and never lets you rest. A great mentor is experienced should have a ton of relevant experience and wisdom that you can draw upon, is where you want to be. You should have a mentor that shares the same vision of success as you. A great mentor will pick you up when you stumble and fall. We all need that. Somebody needs to be there for you, brush off the dirt and say they're there, put a band-aid on it, send you back out. A great mentor is a great listener. Your mentor should be willing to listen to more than just their own opinion. A mentor is invested in your success, and happy to see you succeed, and even potentially surpass it. Right? That's a toughie. A great mentor guides you towards the answer. Mentors should never just give you the answer, but give you the tools to figure it out yourself, because then you learn. Then you become invested in it. Then it's yours forever. A great mentor provides constructive feedback. Your mentor will praise you when you've done right, and most importantly, help you figure out what went wrong. Because stuff's going to go wrong. Stuff, stuff, stuff happens. A great mentor respects you. Should never look down on you, and instead see you as your equal, as their equal. And finally, a great mentor is available. They should always be available to provide the help and advice you need when you need it. So, in our business, it could be at any time of day or night, right? So that's a topic to ask people to do that for you. But that's what you're looking for if you're looking for a great mentor. I had to read books. How many of you read books? Great. During the uh, lockdown when we were locked up and we were told we could only go out and take a walk with our dog, I didn't have a dog then. <laughs> 
but I took myself for a walk. In the first year, I walked 2,000 miles and listened to 200 books on Audible. And the reason I was able to walk so far is I was listening to books, and I had no idea where I was. <laughs> it's true. I look up and wow, I'm here. So. Books that I think that you might want to read, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. This is a classic. Everybody should read this book. Give it to your kids. Uh, Think and Grow Rich, another one, another classic. Classic book. Great principles. The Art of Exceptional Living by Jim Rohn. I can't say enough about Jim Rohn. Jim Rohn turned my life around. And then here's a book that you can still find if you Google it. You're going to buy a used copy though because it's out of print. It's called Listing Magic by Gail, G A Y L E, Hima, H I M M A H. It was written back in the early 80s. Still relevant today. This book is the one that helped me figure out that I should be going for listings. Listings were the name of the game. We were told when we first started in the, in the mid-80s, you have to list to last. Did you hear that one? Old realtors never die, they just become listless. That's true. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> get, a, get your hands on these books and check them out. If you're not willing to learn, no one can help you. I mean, you think you know it all, you're done, you just don't know it yet. We'll just shovel the dirt in on top of you later. Okay. If you're determined to learn, though, no one can stop you. I had to become conversant with the technology tools of the day. In 1986, our technology tools were... <laughs> I see a lot of heads nodding. When you put a buyer in your car, you had better have had that book in the car. Yeah, and you're Thomas Brothers guy. Okay. Yeah. But that book was everybody wanted to see it. And here's the story in that book. It was two weeks old the day you got it. <laughs> and it came out every two weeks. So the first thing we had to do when we were showing a property is call somebody, call a listing agent and say, is 1234 Main Street still available? Every single time. Then we had this. by entering commands. So next to each terminal was a cheat sheet. Here's the command for search for new listings. Here's the command for this. Here's the command for that. And then printed out this long roll of paper. So you put it in your search parameters, and then you went and got coffee. And you came back. And you ripped it off the machine, and you went out to your car. Now, if you left it in your car on a hot summer day, what happened to that thermal paper? It turned black. You had to go through the process again. So this was high tech. I entered into the business right here. We still had the books, and we just got this. This was big time stuff. I took my very first commission check, which was, are you ready for this? $1,200. That was big time money. And I bought this. I'm not going to do it again, fortunately for you. But it had a 300 baud modem, which made that same screechy noise. But this thing, this thing changed everything. This dot matrix printer, and uh, this green screen monitor, and this MXT. I was able to work from home. And since I was working expired listings, I could dial up the MLS at 6 a.m. in the morning. 
and pull the current list of expired listings for the day. And I put them into my little database, which was called ACT, ACT version one. And I was able to start reaching out, touching people with it. it made all the difference in the world. Today, if I was going to be doing the technology of the day, I got all this stuff to deal with. You know, I've got video, texting, blogging, podcasts, social media, there's a bunch of stuff. You've got to master it. You have got to be on top of the technology of the day because your clients are. You've got clients that are using texting. And I was talking with Kevin before the meeting, and I don't know about you, but I still text this way. But everybody else does this. Fortunately for me, you know, I can get by, but I still think that we need to master the technology of the day. Because here's the technology coming. Uh, we've got these CRMs, we've got listing leads that we can buy, we've got other cool stuff like Animoto, things like that. You've got to know all this stuff or work for somebody that'll do it for you. But here's what's around the corner. Oh, let me stop. 20, to, uh, 25 real estate marketing tools for 2022. Get your cameras ready because I want you to take a picture of that. Okay. If not, I'll give it to you later. But here's where it's coming. Come on. I just got the two minute warning, so if you're slow and you haven't mastered your technology yet. Just saying. Okay, here's what's around the corner. Who's heard of the metaverse? What does it mean? Does it matter? Do we care? Do we give it a rip? Damn well better. Here's a search for Metaverse for Realtors. Are there real estate agents in the Metaverse? Yes. This is July, it's going to be January. Metaverse real estate sales top 500 million. February 1, how real estate agents can benefit. February 6, get on Google, do a search, Metaverse for Realtors, get with it. It's coming. How to learn the inventory. We get these tour sheets every day. You need to be out there and you need to go on our caravan tour. Even if you don't have a client for that property, you've got to learn the inventory. You've also got to continue to come to these meetings. You've got to get to know the other agents. Attend meetings. Richest people in the world build networks. Everyone else is trained to look for work. Robert Kiyosaki. Attend the meetings, go to RMA, go to Delta if you're working out that way, Rossmore if you work there. Go to your company sales meetings. You're not too big for that. When I was running offices, I could never understand why people didn't show up. I would spend eight hours prepping for a meeting and people wouldn't come. Get off your butts and go to the meeting. Seriously, you're not too big for that. Go to conferences. Your company has a convention, your butt needs to be there. Uh, if you're a CRS, go to Celebration, go to the car conferences, go to NAR conferences. Or you go open houses again. It's a timer. <laughs> if you don't have something going on on the weekend, it's not a free day. Go out and look at houses. And then I had to learn more about my craft. I went to Graduate Realtor Institute shortly after I started in real estate because Agnes Basson in my office said, Jerry, you're a really nice guy, but you don't know crap about real estate. Go to HGRI. So I did. Now I'm an instructor and I wrote several courses for them. Get your certified residential specialist. When I became a manager, I had to learn that, ePro. And when I got old, which was not too long ago, um, I took the SRES and now I teach that course as well. Do these designations mean anything to the public? No. no. What do they mean? You invested in yourself to learn your craft. Get better at what you do. So wrap it up. 
Get out and ask for business every day. Model your business on successful realtors. Always be curious about how you can improve, set smart goals and work on them. Seek out and engage a mentor or a coach. Read, read, read. Always be learning. Master your technology and be open to the new tech because it's always coming. Learn the inventory. Actually go see houses even if you don't have clients for them. Go see the houses. There's nothing that will trump that. Network, 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 and earn some designations and certifications. And thank you for your time and attention. Wow, thank you, Gary. Gary, here.